I'm Tyler Johnson, and I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my work as well as the collaborations work towards uh, searching for sevens, as well as uh, more exotic searches. So my personal research is much more geared towards uh, the search for neutrino-induced nuclear fission, or new fission for short. If I can get this to advance as well. Cool. So I'm going to start with a really familiar picture that everyone has seen a million times, but the standard model of particle physics. And for this talk, I'm going to zoom uh, almost entirely onto the neutrinos uh, in the lepton sector. And neutrinos are really interesting for a number of reasons, uh, all of which kind of fall out of this kind of quirkiness uh, about how it has no electric charge, very small mass, and interacts really rarely with, uh, with other matter, including itself. Uh, and the big questions about neutrinos that have gone unanswered are plentiful, but some of the big ones are what is its mass? Is experiments like Hatchern going after this? Is it its own antiparticle or is it Majorana? Uh, experiments uh, that go after neutrinoless double beta decay are seeking to answer this question. But the, the seat of the work that, I'm, uh, that I fixate on is how often they interact and what do they interact with? What do they not like to interact with? Um, and to start off that conversation, I'll turn to coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering, or sevens for short. And uh, this is a neutral current interaction. It is caused by the mediation of a Z boson. And what's very nice about this is the Z boson's momentum transfer is such that uh, the, nu or the nucleus is seen as one large object rather than a collection of smaller objects. So you get this corresponding enhancement to the, cr the cross section. And as you can see in this bottom right plot, when you uh, look at a lot of the other common neutrino processes, uh, sevens is much more dominant in this regime of under 100 MeV. So it becomes a, a really useful way to probe uh, neutrino physics, especially since a lot of our sources are right within this energy regime. So supernova terrestrial sources are often right in this window where understanding sevens is very fruitful. The other thing I'll say about sevens on this slide is that it can be a, a precision source of standard model probing. Uh, this is because it's a clean prediction. Uh, theoretical uncertainty is rather low. Uh, that's not to say that the experimental realities are such that we can go straight to that uh, precision. There are a lot of there's a lot of work that has to be done before we can actually realize this potential. And the coherent collaboration is working pretty intensively on on getting us to systematically get to that uh, that sensitive probe. So to start off with a little history lesson, uh, Sevens was predicted a while back, uh, 40 years before its initial observation by the coherent collaboration. And we like to show this paper by Dan Friedman in which he suggests that looking for Sevens is an act of hubris. And this is based on the fact that the experimental backgrounds are grave, as well as the fact that the, ob the observable is quite minuscule. And what I mean by that is what you are looking for in a Sevens interaction is the nuclear recoil. So you're throwing a really tiny particle against a relatively large nucleus, and you're looking for the slight wobble uh, in reaction to that, that scattering. And when you, for example, take a 30 MeV neutrino and throw it against a germanium nucleus, there is a maximum kinematic uh, uh, recoil energy that nucleus can have, in which case, in this case, it is 25 keV, and that's quite small uh, compared to a lot of detecting systems uh, thresholds especially since you want larger detectors to look for neutrinos because uh, they would interact rarely. Um, and you also note that that is the maximum, whereas the majority of the recoils are going to be far lower than that maximum. So even though the cross-section is quite high by uh, neutrino standards, uh, it still is a pretty difficult thing to look for because you're looking for the slight wobble of a nucleus. But there are still many applications of sevens and reasons to go after it that I'll uh, go into a, a short list, not an exhaustive list. So the first is uh, its uh, implications for supernova explosions. Uh, as you might know, core collapse supernovae radiate about 99% of their energy through neutrinos. And there have been certain models that suggest that the seven scattering within these uh, Core collapse supernovae is what reinvigorates the, the shock front in order to accelerate the iron layer to escape velocity. So the reason it explodes, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, I've also been told that there are models that do not require this. Although understanding the transport of these neutrinos in this astronomical event is still very important. Uh, the next thing is kind of what I alluded to earlier. You can start to probe the standard model in a new way. 
uh, two such characters that you can start to look into are the weak mixing angle, whereas uh, where the cross section for sevens includes the weak mixing angle as a term. And you can start to say something about uh, that weak mixing angle in this energy regime where the, the error bars are still large. The other thing that you can start to pin down is the neutrino's magnetic moment, whether it is not zero or existent at all. If there is a non-zero magnetic moment, the nuclear recoil spectrum of the sevens events actually changes shape. And as you get towards a detector that's sensitive to these sort of things, you can start to say something about what that value may be. And then next, you can start to say something about sterile neutrinos. Uh, so a common ground to look for sterile neutrinos are nuclear reactors. They radiate uh, almost 100% through electron antineutrinos. And so the common way you, you detect these neutrinos is through inverse beta decay. And when you have an oscillation out of that electron flavor and you say a muon flavor, these detectors are no longer able to see them. The muon that is required in the final state is too heavy for these, this energy of neutrinos, so it becomes lost to you. Whereas a seven detector is flavor blind, so an oscillation outside of what your detector can see would suggest is not oscillating between the active flavors, the, the electron, the muon, and the tau, it's oscillating into something else, like a sterile neutrino. And that's one of the advantages of having a flavor blind detection channel. And then the last thing, I, and I won't belabor this because there are many dark matter specialists, much more erudite than me in this room. Uh, and that is to, it helps with the search for direct uh, with dark matter. Uh, the observables are quite similar. You're looking for a nuclear recoil. And as these dark matter detectors get more and more sensitive, they're going to be privy to the backgrounds that neutrinos in, from the sun, from the atmosphere, uh, are going to contribute into their region of interest. And understanding this sevens component will be quite important when they reach this uh, supposed neutrino floor or neutrino fog. So I am a representative of the Coherent Collaboration, and we are about 80 members spanning 20 institutions around the world. Uh, it was formed specifically to look for sevens, as the name would suggest. And we're largely based at Oak Ridge National Lab, specifically the Spallation Neutron Source uh, for its neutrinos. And there is this emerging wing of the collaboration that is looking after looking for inelastic neutrino nucleus scattering, we call incoherent. And this is the where the majority of my work actually happens. But first, how exactly do we get our neutrinos out of the SNS? Well, the SNS is this supremely intense neutron source, but it's serendipitously also this really great isotropic source of neutrinos and it's pulsed. Uh, so the coherent collaboration moved into the basement and renamed it Neutrino Alley. And we're taking full advantage of this uh, very fertile ground for doing neutrino experiments. And uh, one, a few of the good things about Neutrino Alley is it's really close to the target at about 20 meters. So this gives us a high flux of neutrinos, um, but it's also very short on neutron backgrounds. We like to say that it is neutron quiet, but is it neutron silent? Uh, there is some still component of the neutron background there, but it's really diminished, especially when you consider that the SNS is engineered specifically to produce neutrons, and a lot of them. So looking a little bit closer at the alley, as I said, it's neutron quiet. So we've deployed a series of neutron uh, background monitoring detectors all throughout the hallway, all throughout time, and beam powers and beam configurations. I won't belabor the exact detectors, some of which I've listed here. Just know that we take this background seriously and we've been mapping it over time and over the span of the hallway. So the SNS then produces our neutrinos, but how? So it takes about one GeV of protons and smacks them into a liquid mercury target. Inside that liquid mercury target, you're now producing a flurry of pi pluses that are then going to decay with a half-life of 26 nanoseconds into mu pluses and muon neutrinos. And this is what we call the, the prompt pulse of the neutrinos. And then those mean pluses are the, then going to decay into positrons, electron neutrinos, and muon antineutrinos, and what we call the delayed spectrum of the neutrinos. And that's what you see in the blue in this time figure here. And another point I'll kind of hit on on this uh, slide is the fact that this beam is pulsed at 60 hertz. So it's delivering protons at that frequency. And when you couple that with the fact that these neutrinos are pretty tight in time, you get a really excellent background suppression because we know the majority of a second doesn't actually contain a neutrino and we know which parts of the second to look, which parts not to look. 
So we get this really great background suppression that you really don't get at a steady state source like a nuclear reactor. So in this program towards a precision search or precision program for sevens, you start off with its discovery, ending the 40 year mystery. So this is the first observation of sevens uh, by the coherent collaboration uh, using a cesium iodide scintillating crystal, which you see here in the cover of science. And this result rejected the null hypothesis by 6.8 sigma. Uh, and I won't belabor the plots too much, but just to say that you can start to kind of disambiguate the flavors of these neutrinos that you're seeing in your event, uh, events, plural, because there's that difference in timing structure between the prompt and the delayed spectra of neutrinos, you know which flavors are in which section. You can start to do some probes of, is this actually a flavor blind process by looking at the composition of those bit components. And the results uh, uncertainty budget actually lays out a really good roadmap for how to get towards precision, looking at what are the greatest sources of uncertainty so we can start addressing them in a more systematic way. So some of the predominant sources of uncertainty for this first discovery measurement were the quenching factor, more on that later, the neutrino flux, the form factor, and statistics, all of which will be addressed later in this talk to varying degrees. Uh, but first, let's move along on this, uh, this um, journey towards a precision experiment or precision experiments, plural. And the first thing I would say that we looked at was the to greater, greater understand the background, specifically the neutron related backgrounds. So these are particularly pernicious because neutrons that end up leaking into your detector can induce nuclear recoils. And these two neutron related backgrounds I'll talk about are actually in time with the beam. So they can pretty easily trick you if you're not aware of them. So the first one is these beam-related neutrons. These are fast neutrons that come off of the, the target and make their way to our detectors. Uh, they're going to be prompt. They're going to be in line with the prompt pulse of the neutrinos. And then the second are neutrino-induced neutrons. So this is when specifically electron neutrinos come off of the SNS target and hit, instead of our detector, they hit the shielding material around the detector, kick off a neutron uh, by exciting the daughter nucleus, which is bismuth in this case, if you hit a lead nucleus, and that bismuth is going to emit neutrons in order to get rid of that energy. And those neutrons can then propagate to your detector almost in time with the beam and trick you into thinking that these neutrons are delayed neutrinos. Um, so well, the first in intervention we did for this was to deploy a liquid scintillator cell inside the shielding package for the cesium iodide detector. And uh, this is what we call the Elgin cell. And we took data uh, with the beam on, uh, with this liquid scintillator replacing the cesium iodide cell. And uh, this is the result. You can see there's a clear excess in the prompt, uh, prompt region of the beam, which suggests that we're seeing beam-related neutrons uh, coming off of the accelerator. There's also this smaller excess of uh, delayed events that are in line with the structure of the delayed neutrinos, which suggests that we are also seeing neutrino-induced neutrons, or NINs. So we can go even further, and that's what we did with these neutrino cube detectors. These are two separate detectors looking specifically at NINs events. And you intersperse liquid scintillator cells within common shielding materials. So in this case, that's 900 kilograms of lead and 700 kilograms of iron. And it's very much the same principle. You have electron neutrinos hitting those target nuclei, producing neutrons, and then propagate to your detector for uh, observation. And the result of this, which is fairly recent, uh, was that the, uh, the best fit number of NIMS events is actually pretty low compared to the nominal theory predictions. And more work is being done to better understand where that discrepancy comes in. But in the for if your one goal is to look at sevens, that's that's pretty good. This background is lower than anticipated. So then the next step is to improving the quenching factors. And when I say quenching factor, it's really a, a stand-in for understanding how, uh, how much energy of, that you're depositing is going towards an observed channel. So in the case of a cesium iodide detector, it's a scintillator. So how much, what fraction of the energy you're depositing is going towards scintillation rather than an un unobserved channel, in this case, would be phonons or uh, ionization. So to do this, we turn to my place of work, Tunnel, and we have a tandem vanograph accelerator in the basement uh, that produces a monoenergetic pulse of neutrons. And you smack that monoenergetic uh, pulse of neutrons into a central detector that you want to study. So in this case, cesium iodide. 
And then you surround that central detector with vacuum detectors and you can kinematically construct or reconstruct what, what amount of energy went into that central detector based on the angle that that neutron scattered in. And with this pretty uh, detailed campaign, which was actually before my time at Tunnel, they were able to decrease this uncertainty from 28% to about 4%, which is a, a pretty good improvement. So the one of the other big sources of uncertainty in that first uh, data set was the statistics. So you can solve that just by running longer. So the way they went after reducing that uncertainty was looking at the full data set, which has about a factor of 1.8 times the exposure of the first data set. And with that, they went from about 16% uncertainty to about 10. Uh, in a perfect world, you keep going forever, but uh, that's the amount of data we have on the cesium iodide detector. And with that, those improvements, uh, we were able to go from that 6.8 sigma uh, rejection of the null hypothesis to about 11.6 sigma. And that's the, the timing fit you see in this plot. So we can actually start to do some multi-nucleus studies. And this is coming down to the, the quirk that the cross-section for sevens is proportional to the neutron number squared, where it just so happens that uh, sine squared of the uh, weak mixing angle is about one fourth. So you get this cancellation of the number of, of protons. So the cross-section predominantly corresponds to the number of neutrons. This becomes a really nice test of whether or not we're adhering to this cross-section into the standard model by mapping out the neutron number square of many nuclei. So this first nucleus of cesium iodide lies right within the prediction of what, where we'd expect. And we can start to add different detection materials to start filling that out and understanding if there are deviations. So the first step towards that was with the deployment of a, or of a liquid argon-based detector called SINS-10. And this is 10 kilograms of liquid argon, and it has two scintillators uh, or two PMTs on both sides, and it is a scintillator. And this result is shown here. It rejected the null hypothesis by three sigma and lies right within where we'd expect uh, this cross section, this flex average cross section to be, according to the standard model. And I will also note that this result uh, uh, still has more improvement because we're looking at an even larger data set right now. And that release should be actually very imminent. So look out for that. And then we can keep on going and keep uh, going towards precision with these germanium PPC detectors that are really excellent. Uh, they have really great, low, they have really low energy thresholds, which gives us access to a much greater number of these sevens interactions. They have really great energy resolution, which is also very helpful. Um, and I'll just note, I'm gonna skip this, but I'm gonna say that uh, we just public, not published, but just presented uh, the germanium results, the first germanium result at DMP this past uh, fall and into winter, where we have a rejection of the null hypothesis by about 3.9 sigma. And this is the, the key figure of that result. And I'll also add that this is from one beam period of the SNS. Uh, the backgrounds are so low, even at this uh, pretty shallow, we're not underground basically at all. Uh, even with that, the backgrounds are so low that the significance is after only a couple months of running, and we plan to run for a lot longer with even greater mass. So the, the power of this measurement will only keep increasing and increasing, uh, even in a short amount of time. And now we can go to like even larger detectors for even lighter nuclei, and that's the naivete uh, detector. This is our first ton scale experiment, and it's based out of these 7.7 .7 kilogram sodium iodide crystals that we got from the Department of Homeland Security after their advanced spectroscopic portal program went under. So we have about seven tons of these and we need something to do with them. So we're making this ton scale sevens experiment. Um, has its troubles. These are all individually instrumented detectors. So you have to have a ton of electronics uh, to support all of them. And that's why this effort is currently being commissioned and moving uh, at a pretty rapid pace, but this is every module we, we deploy, which is 63 of these crystals, has its, its own homemade electronics. Uh, so this grad student, Adriana Major, who is really spearheading all of this, uh, deserves all the credit in the world. Uh, but every time we deploy a new module, we get a significantly higher exposure and sensitivity. Uh, so 
think we only have two more modules to deploy and we plan on doing that this summer. So we should be up to five modules, each 63 kilo, 63 detectors. So several tons of sodium iodide crystals altogether. But in the meantime, we did this test stand called Naive 185, which is the very same sodium iodide crystals, 7.7 kilograms. Uh, and the initial reason for it was to determine that we could actually do the seven search. Uh, so it really quickly demonstrated that the thresholds were there, that we can actually build this ton scale experiment. But after its first mission was uh, successful, we pivoted it to looking for the charge current interaction on iodine-127. And it was uh, just recently published in PRL that we saw uh, this clear sign that uh, we, we we're actually seeing these charge current events on the iodine by looking for this charge current electron in the final state, which has a pretty high energy and goes above most of the backgrounds, albeit is mired with muons, so muon beta was in, was in order. Uh, but this was the first measurement of this um, of this cross section. And then towards the going bigger ethos, uh, this is the large scale uh, liquid argon sevens detector. So we're graduating from 10 kilograms to 750 kilograms with COR 750. And this will be enjoying about 3,007 events a year uh, and is in collaboration between Indiana and Korea. And I won't say too much about this detector other than it also comes along with its own charge current uh, inelastic uh, measurement, which will be on argon. Uh, and this is really important to experiments like Doom. Uh, so we're charging ahead with these complementary searches, all the while doing seven searches, uh, moving towards this high precision. And the only uncertainty I haven't really touched on that was a pretty major one in the earlier results is this uncertainty of the neutrino flux. And we're addressing this 10% uncertainty with the deployment of these heavy water Cherenkov detectors, we call R2B2O. And it is a ploy to get down to about 2 to 3% uncertainty because the theoretical uncertainty on this cross section on deuterium is actually quite low, about 2 to 3%. So over time, we should uh, be expecting our uncertainty uh, budget to continually decrease with the deployment of, we now have one of these 600 kilogram heavy water detectors, and we're currently working on it, uh, putting up a second. Can you back up your slide real quick? Yeah. Uh, can you remind me for that channel, do you uh, identify, is there like a photon that comes off of the potassium at the end? There you go. Now, this is like a dual, oh, like I a see. dual thing where you detect the electron and the I don't know that we're going for a coincident measurement. I'm not certain what the half-life is on that okay. uh, potassium. Party, I'm so. But uh, the the electron is so energetic that it should reach above the majority of what would be its background. Okay. But if that's not sufficient, or we find that the muons are really swamping it, uh, that that could be an option okay. if, yeah, if the half-life is conducive. Answer. Yeah, if it's quick enough, then why not? Okay. <laughs> Um, so incumbent on the heavy water detectors, water has oxygen and that therefore its own background, uh, which would be charge current interactions on the oxygen 16 inside of it. And that, if you look at the observed energy of the heavy water charge current and the oxygen, you can see that the electrons energy spectra are overlapping. So this really requires us to dig deep into that uh, interaction channel to make sure we understand it and get the first measurement on oxygen as well on the on the way to this measurement on deuterium to decrease this uncertainty to two to three percent. And that's its own exciting prospect. And I'm sure you've noticed this somewhat organic extension of the sevens program into this inelastic, uh, incoherent uh, wing. Uh, I find it very exciting. These are, uh, in the, for the most part, coming for free well, along with all these detectors. And you'll note that if you look at the periodic table, uh, Dr. Sanhe just put this together. There are very few measurements of nuclei in this energy regime of, of below 300 MeV. Uh, the, the red boxes are the interactions that have been measured before us. And then coherent is filling in with these yellow boxes. My work actually focuses on the heaviest of them all, which is on thorium. And this is the heaviest nucleus that's been tried. And it's also the first radioactive nucleus. And that's what I'll try to start going into now, uh, rather dramatically. So neutrinos are inextricably linked to nuclear fission, and that is because there is a history of it that neutrinos were discovered from nuclear fission. 
uh, this being the Nobel Prize won by Ryan Zacohen in 1956, uh, where they discovered neutrinos at Savannah River, and they got them from the nuclear reaction happening. Nuclear fission produces new, uh, uh, fission fragments that then beta decay because they're really unstable, and you produce an average of six electron antineutrinos per fission in that way. But I guess we're also asking the question, can you flip that, that scenario? Can you get uh, nuclear fission out of neutrinos? And this process is pretty straightforward. It's similar to the neutrino induced neutron, where you have an electron neutrino coming in and exchanging a W boson with some nucleus. It, it emits a, an electron to conserve lepton number. And as well as it excites this nucleus, and nuclei want to get rid of the energy that they are imparted. So it will potentially uh, get rid of that energy through nuclear fission uh, or new fission, new for neutrino. And this also has a pretty storied history, similar, actually a little bit longer than the sevens interaction. Uh, this has about an arc of 52 to 53 years. Uh, and this paper is the first example I could find, but it still doesn't enjoy a experimental confirmation. And interestingly enough, this paper also lays out somewhat of a recipe for how to go after this reaction. And there have been several more papers since then about how, how one would do this rather challenging uh, measurement. So let's start off with what elements should we try to split with our neutrinos? We have a ton to choose from, but you really want to just consider the ones that are fissionable. They have a threshold for undergoing nuclear fission that's achievable by whatever neutrino source you have. Uh, you don't want to set it above where your neutrinos could possibly push your, your nucleus. So this really gives us the actinide series and its nearest neighbors as possibilities to be our target. Second, it shouldn't be overly dangerous. I don't want to work with polonium or anything like that. So I strike those out. And then next, it needs to be available in kilogram quantities. Recall, neutrinos rarely interact with matter. So you hedge against the rarity by amassing a lot of targets for it to potentially hit. So you really need many kilograms of whatever it is you're trying to hit. Uh, and that pretty much winnows the competition down to thorium or uranium. Everything else on our list was more or less a rare earth element and just intractably expensive. So the last thing that beats out uh, the competition is you want the spontaneous fission rate to be rather low. You want to have high confidence that you're fissioning your nucleus with these neutrin neutrinos. They're not fissioning on their own. So that pretty much decides it for us that thorium is our target of choice. The half-life uh, or the spontaneous fission rate for thorium is five orders of magnitude lower than uranium, uh, depleted uranium specifically. So with thorium in mind, we went about finding some thorium metal, uh, and we found it in a basement in Oak Ridge. And we have exactly 52 kilograms or 115 pounds of this uh, refined thorium metal. And you can see some of the discs here. And we stacked them up concentrically, put them into a custom-made canister, and shipped them out to from one side of Oak Ridge to the other, which required this radioactive barrel or drum. And then we eventually installed them into the apparatus that I'll talk about a little bit later. But we can now talk with a bit more specificity on what this reaction is. So we have our thorium nucleus and we strike it with an electron neutrino from the SNS. And so it's capturing onto this nucleus and that capture process is aided by two intrinsic resonances. The first is the giant gamma octal resonance. And then the second one is the isobaric analog state. So you're then producing this protactinium. You're transmuting thorium into this nucleus by flipping a neutron into a proton. And this protactinium is left in a highly excited state. And we'll want to get rid of that energy somehow. And the two primary uh, decay channels for this nucleus are either neutron emission or nuclear fission. And in this way, you get neutrino-induced neutron emission, or NIMS, or you get neutrino-induced nuclear fission, or new fission. Uh, this being the signal of choice for me, but there are many out there that are really interested in this. For instance, HALO, they are looking for supernova neutrinos through this channel fell on lead. So one man's treasure is another man. Uh, another one. one man's trash is another one's treasure. So we, all, we also need to calculate how often we expect these interactions, these capture, captures to happen. So this was a bit non-trivial. So we turned to a collaborator at UNC Chapel Hill, Professor John Engel. And what he provided with us was this beta strength function, which tells you 
the, the top line is it tells you the probability of going between an initial state in the thorium and the final state in the protactinium via this neutri neutrino capture. And you can evolve this information with certain facets about the thorium nuclease as well as the weak interaction. You end up with this cross section as a function of the neutrino energy. And you can go even further and ask yourself, okay, so how, what is the excitation energy of these neutrino interactions and what angular momentum do they get? And you can turn to a statistical decay code called ABLA or ablation. And it'll tell you what the branching ratios is for these uh, certain configurations. And you can break these down into partial cross sections for a new fission, for instance, which is this red dotted line. And I'm gonna make it a little confusing then I promise to distill it back down. You can also ask what is the probability of emitting one neutron, two neutrons, all throughout the, the however many neutrons you want. Uh, so you can ask, What's the cross section, or the partial cross section of a new fission event emitting five neutrons? And you can go through this continuum. And when you convolve this with the neutrino spectrum of the SNS, specifically the electron neutrino spectrum, you can end up with this flux average cross section as a function of neutron multiplicity. And this lays out the detection scheme uh, that we employ, which you can see that the average number of neutrons emitted per event is quite high for a new fission event, whereas say a NINS event has a lower average neutrons emitted. So we are looking for uh, simultaneous neutron emissions or observations in tandem with the neutrino pulse of the SNS. So that is our primary signal. So now I can talk about my favorite part, which is the detector I spent the past four years designing, simulating, building, and now analyzing the new Thor detector, new for neutrino Thor for thorium. And the center of this uh, mass is this 52 kilograms of thorium metal. Uh, as of now, we have a, about 3,000 beam hours collected and hopefully going to collect a few more thousand this summer, uh, given uh, the SNS stays to its schedule. But just to walk through the principle of this detector, the centerpiece, like I said, is those 52 kilograms of thorium, which are placed on this pedestal, what I call the inner core. And immediately around that is stacked a bunch of lead bricks. These are to keep the intrinsic radioactive gamma rays coming off of the thorium away from the active components of this detector. And th those two items constitute the inner core. Immediately around the inner core is this neutron multiplicity meter, which has many components. So you can see this is our, the test bill they did at Duke University. And the first and very integral component of the neutron multiplicity meter are these gadolinium loaded uh, water bricks. And the principle is that neutrons will stream out of the thorium through the lead and then start hitting the water to moderate. And once these reach thermal energies, they're going to largely capture on these gadolinium nuclei. Gadolinium has one of the highest capture cross sections for thermal neutrons in the universe. And it also has a really handy principle that once they capture, they're going to emit on average about eight MeV and gamma rays, which are very observable. Uh, specifically by these 36 sodium iodide crystals I've shingled all around the detector. Uh, these are the same sodium iodide crystals used in the naivete and naive 185 detectors from Homeland Security because uh, we are very thrifty. And we are detecting all of, or as many as possible those gamma ray cascades coming off of the gadolinium captures. And then immediately around that, at the outermost section, is this thick layer of 30% borated polyethylene. This is to keep environmental neutrons out of the system. Uh, it makes it a whole lot cleaner if there is some separation between inside and outside. So we can take a sample event where we have, let's say one new fission event right in the thorium and it emits three neutrons. The first neutron doesn't make it out of the detector, out of the inner core, let's say, just due to some non-zero amount not making it out. Um, the second, let's say, pretty rapidly captures onto a gadolinium. Uh, it didn't have too much energy, so it didn't have to moderate too much. And then it shoots out its cascade of gamma rays and those hit three sodium iodide crystals. The second neutron or the third neutron takes a little bit to moderate, but eventually captures and then hits two uh, sodium iodide crystals. So when you look at the waveforms of these 36 sodium iodide crystals, uh, all lined up in time, you can see there's some clear evidence that something is happening. And when you go through and cluster them with some coincidence window, you can start to neutron count. So in this way, in this case, you would take this three neutron event and you'd actually reconstruct it as a two neutron event because just the inherent inefficiencies of having a detector. Um, so this would be considered a two neutron event. 
And when you go through and simulate, uh, in this case, we use MCMP Fleamy. Uh, here's the new, uh, new Thor geometry as used in this MCMP simulation. And you go through and you look at the efficiencies and start to smear your nominal distribution of neutrons with, with the truth information to turn it into what, whatever you would actually reconstruct in your detector. And you can see that there's this consistent smearing towards the lower multiplicities, although there's still an excess of events at these higher multiplicities. And your background will be smeared in the same way, but not uh, will not will still not uh, occupy these higher bins. So when you take all of the beam related or backgrounds that will be inside your beam window in this case, so neutron induced or neutrino induced neutrons on your various detector components or even the target itself, and you put them all together with your uh, reconstruction. Uh, you can see that there's an excess of these higher reconstructed neutron multiplicities. Uh, when you uh, when you have a new fission panel or compared to when you don't. And the comparison of these two scenarios is uh, in principle what we're looking at looking for. There's a bit more work being done in terms of like discriminating the steady state background. So like I said, thorium is radioactive. It's shooting off gamma rays at 2.6 MeV due to the natural decay series of thorium going to thallium. And what we're currently trying to do R&D on is that it seems that a boosted decision tree is able to distinguish between those two things, these thallium gammas and these gat uh, gadolinium cascades. There are some clear differences in the event topologies between them. And it seems pretty uh, able to find that difference. Uh, and other than that, uh, Coherent has a lot of future work uh, currently being commissioned and designed and proposed, some of which are, I'm going to touch on. The first one being the SLAC cube, uh, Yonsei Sai at SLAC is really engineering. This one is going to work after uh, the charge current interaction on argon in order to really squash the uncertainties for supernova detection. Uh, we're also looking into cryogenic detectors now, so cryogenic cesium iodide, which will boast a really high light yield and produce even greater precision and uh, sensitivity to standard model testing, as well as BGO, uh, which BGO we're looking at as both Sevens detector and potentially an elastics detector. These are me and a, a few of the grad students in my group back at Duke working on some prototypes in the lab. And we're also working on this lead glass Cherenkov detector that we we had the students build a little tester, deploy to the SNS and get their, their uh, detector deployment chops early on in their career. Uh, they can say they deployed a neutrino detector, although it will have zero counts at the end of the day. <laughs> um, other than that, the SNS is powering up. We're, this summer, we're getting a power upgrade, which will dramatically increase the neutrino flux, as well as we're moving towards having a second station of the SNS. So everything I've said before or before this has been talking about the first target station. They're going to build a second target station, which will operate simultaneously. And we'll be able to do a lot of cool studies with this greater power, as well as having different baselines between the neutron sources to start doing a lot of oscillation studies. So with that, uh, thank you for having me. OK, questions for Tyler? Question. So like in the Slack too, you said you're measuring charge current argon. Mm -hmm. Is that the same charge current argon you were talking about? I asked about earlier. Okay. Yeah, if that's the same thing. Okay. Yeah, it's like so two. That, like take a better measurement or. How um, I guess this well, part of the impetus to do the slack cube is that it's instrumented very similar to Dune, so it's like a a Dune tester. Like they want to understand what the uh how well supernova bursts will be detectable in Dune or other large liquid argon systems that are TPCs. And Slack Cube really helps them constrain the uncertainties on that. So the Slack Cube is deployed at SNS? It will be. Okay. With time. <laughs> so you have uh, measurements uh, with sodium iodide. Yes, we have a charge current uh, measurement. So, so uh, how is the background and the signal, the incident kind of uh, signal? For how is your signal to background? Oh, it's it's decent. These sodium iodide crystals were not built to be low background, like how 
dama or cosine were. Uh, so they're flecked with thallium and potassium 40. So that's kind of going off at all times. And we have we have a muon veto, which tamps down some steady state backgrounds in that way. Um, so part of what I'm doing right now is going after how do we further reduce the background in this region of interest, which is 10 to 55 MeV. So it's hard for radioactive sources to get there. Uh, I would say the primary backgrounds that we have to contend with are beam related neutrons, which, you know, with a, a beam that goes up to one GeV, you can get neutrons up to like 400, 500 MeV. So there's really nothing we can do to stop them from going where they want to go. So no amount of shielding will stop those. Yeah, our region of interest for sodium iodide is about 10 MeV. So when, when that is activated, I think it's when it, when it captures, when the neutron captures on iodine, uh, that's about 6.8 MeV. Right, so so it's, it's just like right above, right below right. where we're cutting off. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm asking because uh, we try to calculate some sensitivity based on this uh, dark matter in elastic nucleus. At that time, we assume that we would be sensitive to this uh, 6.8 MeV for sodium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, it just so happens that the distribution of the charged current electrons coming off of the, I guess, then xenon daughter nucleus from this uh, inelastic uh, are centered around 25 MeV, and there's not too much that tails off into below 10 MeV, so we felt comfortable cutting it off there. Other questions? Joe? Okay, so if not, uh, the rest time is good.